Good afternoon and welcome to another session of our Build Your Career Forum. Last year we did this as a live in-person session and this year because of COVID we're going to a re recorded and live Zoom session. So welcome students. If you could go ahead and put your name, school, and grade in the chat and if you haven't already please uh, uh, we'd love to see your faces so go ahead and take and put your video camera on that would be fantastic um, with that i'd like to introduce kelsey king from scott community college who's going to talk more about the program thank you mary um so before we start um i know some of you have questions that you've submitted already but if you do have questions that go um come up during this presentation please go ahead and put those in the chat. And if you would um, put the comment to everyone um, so everyone can see your question, that would be great. Um, so I'm Kelsey King. I serve as the Admissions and Community Outreach Coordinator for Scott Community College. I'm really excited to be here with all of you today and I have the pleasure of introducing Jenny and Denny. Um, Jenny is with the Masonry Institute of Iowa. Jenny is the director of a nonprofit association that represents masonry contractors and suppliers around the state. Her focus is on workforce development in the industry. Jenny has, Jenny has a BA in journalism and mass communication from ISU and a master's of public administration from Drake University. Also joining us today will be Denny with Sherman Williams. Denny has worked at Sherman Williams Paints as a sales representative since 2004, and he graduated from the University of Iowa. So again, thank you both for joining us. Um, Jenny, I'll turn it over to you quick, as I, as I think Denny's still getting logged in to join us, but will you just talk a little bit more about yourself and what it is that you do? Yeah. Um... MII is a nonprofit association, so it's a membership-based organization made up of the suppliers, contractors, anyone um, that has, that's associated with the industry. And <clears throat> our purpose is, purpose is to promote masonry construction, and one of our biggest focus is on workforce development. Um, just as any trade, uh, we're always looking for good workers. So thank you for having me today. Thanks for being with us. So I think we'll pull up the next slide and it'll just um, talk a little bit more about masonry and bricklayer. So will you just elaborate a little bit more on that career? Okay, masonry is the building of structures from single units such as a brick, a block, or a piece of stone. And then it's typically laid in the wall and bound together by mortar. Um, the person that places that unit um, in the wall is called a bricklayer and there are some other, besides just being a bricklayer, there's some restoration and repair that you can do, cleaning um, and mixing and setting up the scaffolding. And, you know, there's a lot of landscape uh, masonry out there. And so it's not just laying the unit into a wall. There's a lot of other things that go along with it to create that wall. And so that, that is what masonry is, and that is what bricklayers do. I think the next slide will just kind of show some pictures. Um, yeah. Kelsey, this is Julie, and Denny's getting on. He's just taking just a minute, okay? Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. All right. And so I put a couple pictures in here that I want to talk about. The top two there are the bricklayers laying brick into a wall, and so that, that's what the brick are. The picture on the bottom right, those are block that they're laying in the wall, and then the picture on the bottom left, uh, that is finishing up the mortar joint so that after you lay up the brick in or block into a wall, you take this little metal tool and you go along the edges to make a smooth mortar joint. Um, and so, um, give you an idea and some of the qualities that you would need as a bricklayer is um, hard work um, it is a physically demanding job you need to be able to work as a team um, and we see some of the best bricklayers are actually athletes um, because they have that competitive spirit and so you see that as you work with a team but yet you want to lay more brick than the next guy you want to see how fast you can get that course like compared to the other bricklayer on the job and so we 
like I said, we do see a lot of athletes excel in this um, arena. And you have to have an eye for detail. You know, you need to keep those courses level and plumb. You need to have some basic math skills. So yes, you need to be able to um, add a few fractions, figure out how many brick you're gonna need for a job, um, figure out some simple math on the job site skill. Um, and so that's some of you know those qualities that you need to be a good bricklayer. And the thing I think that doesn't get talked about enough is, and this is in every skilled trade, um, the room or growth for advancement is uh, huge. And so you may go through and become a bricklayer, but then you can become a superintendent, a foreman, you can own your own masonry company, you can go work in sales. So there's a lot of other opportunity out there. And so I want to mention our website, I want to be a bricklayer.com that has all the information about what it takes to be a bricklayer, how you get into it. And so here in Iowa, um, most of the state, um, the only training program in the state is the local union, which is BAC, Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers. Local three covers most of the state of Iowa. If you're actually in the Quad Cities, you are on the um, Quad Cities, which is the local six from Illinois, and you're for over in Omaha, you're over in the Nebraska um, Union. And so they offer a four-year apprenticeship at no cost, so you're not taking on any college debt. And over the course of those four years, you uh, learn the skills of the trade. So after your fourth year, you're considered a journey person, you know, you're, you're advanced at your skill. Um, and so a lot of it is earn while you learn. You're, you're on the job site, learning from the other bricklayers. You, as a pre-apprentice, you, you attend a eight week course that they put a trowel in your head to teach you the basics. And some of the other benefits that the union training provides you is you, it's got some amazing benefits with health care and retirement. You don't have any college debt. And you can earn up to 44 credit hour, community credit um, hours towards an AA degree um, by attending the BAC training. And Jenny, what's the age on that? That's a question a lot of students seem to have in these sessions is how, what age um, can they start getting some- You need experiences? to be 18 to enter the apprenticeship program and have a high school diploma or a GED. And when you come off, uh, so probably the thing you want to know most is how much do you get paid? And so coming off after your four-year apprenticeship, your total package, and it does depend where you're working at in Iowa, but you're looking around $50 an hour with wages and benefits. And so what it is when you start out, you're probably making closer to $15 to $18 an hour plus benefits, and you're getting raises about every six months, uh, they're in demand, so they're paying above scale. And you can find um, some of that information, like I said, on the IWantToBeABricklayer.com on the, the pay scale and everything. What are some of the hours that bricklayers work? What's their day look like? Um, usually it's early mornings, especially during the summer. Um, you know, they're gonna start at 6, 7 a.m., be done by early afternoon. Uh, this day and age, they can work year round if you want, um, because they're, they'll have indoor work or they will tent the job sites so that they keep um, everything warm enough to lay the brick. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about the conditions? I mean, I see workers up on the scaffolding there. Obviously, they're high up off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, you said they can work year long. So can you speak a little bit more about the elements and the work conditions that they are? It's it is mainly an outdoor job, so you are out in the elements. But like I said, um, to lay mortar, it has to be 40 degrees. So if you fall under that 40 degrees, they're either moving inside to work, you know, you'll have the day off, or they are going to set up um, a temporary enclosure that they heat up um, to keep. Because so I've been out on a job site on a very cold day where they had it tented, and it was nice and cozy in that indoor space that they set up, so.
And how long does it take? I know you mentioned the apprenticeship was four years. Four years. Four years. So um, during that, they're learning everything they need. They're ready to go out into the job then and start. Or is there any kind of um, extra training or anything that they have through that? You no, know, what, it, what it is when you start out as a high school student, um, you would probably start out as a Mason support because you would graduate in May. We would help um, find an employer for you to work for and you would do everything a bricklayer doesn't. So you'd be setting up the scaffolding, mixing mortar, you know, driving the skid loader around, delivering pallets of brick and block. And then you would enter the next spring in March and April and you would do the pre-apprentice program, which is eight weeks of training. They'd get the trowel in your hand. And then you would go back on the job site June one or May one as a first year apprentice. And they would actually then you would be able to get on the line and start uh, being a bricklayer. And from there, over the next course of the next three years, you are usually going back into training for a week to two weeks, usually during the winter months, um, to get that additional training that you would need to keep building your skill set. I know before you said that athletes typically do pretty well, just that competitive nature that they have, but can you speak to some of the like physical conditions? Is it a lot of like heavy lifting or um, can you just talk a little bit more about that? There is. Uh, so a block weighs about four or a brick, uh, yeah, a block weighs about 40 to 50 pounds, depending on what it is. And Um, you know, a lot of times they move that with um, equipment. They'll put, as you can see, kind of in that picture there, um, the one where there's some brick laying there. So they bring it to you. So you're just lifting, turning around, lifting, putting it in the line. And so um, there, there is, you know, some that physical element. But yet again, on the other hand, uh, you're not going to need a gym membership. What are some of the um, highlights of being a bricklayer and also what are maybe some of the drawbacks or challenges that they face? Um, one of the highlights is you get to work on some really cool projects and those structures are going to be around for a really long time. And I can tell you every bricklayer out there when they're driving down the road with their family or friends and they go past a building that they helped build, they're going to look over, point at it and say, I built that. So it's going to be around, you know, Masonry is going to last for hundreds of years. So you take pride in that job of what you built because you're, you're going to see it. You can point it out to friends and family. Um, you know, the drawback is, you know, it, it is a physically demanding job. You know, we're not going to sugarcoat it. You know, you're, you're, you're putting in a hard day's work. Um, and so that's something you've got to decide if you're used to that hard work, you know, it, it won't be an issue, but it can be if it's not something that you're used to. We have, can we take a minute and just introduce, Denny's joined us now. And so Denny, if you want to take yourself off the mute and put your microphone, turn your microphone on and introduce yourself, that would be fantastic and welcome. Thank you. I apologize everybody about being late. Unfortunately, our meeting ran over a little bit, but uh, Fox, I work for the Sherman Williams Paint Company. As you can see, I've uh, uh, been with Sherman Williams for 17 years. I've been in the paint industry for over 35 years. I started my career in the paint industry as a assistant manager at a company by the name of Iowa Paint, which is no longer uh, around. It's been bought up over the years. Um, so paint has been very good to me. It's been a, it's been a, uh, a great career for me. Um, so that's me in a nutshell. I have a, a wife with three kids and uh, five grandkids. And then you want to tell us a little bit about the painting world and some of the education and training that you may need? Yeah, absolutely. So the painting world, you know, there's many 
benefits of the painting world from, uh, um, and I and I can speak from the other side of the paint because I sell it, right? So we sell to several different types of painters. And I, I, let me just walk through those just briefly. Um, you guys are probably familiar, or most people are familiar with painters that come to your house and paint it, you know, like, hey, mom wants to have a fresh coat of paint in the living room. We call those people residential repainters. Um, we also have uh, painters in, in, that we sell to that are new residential painters. So every new house that's being built in the Quad Cities uh, has to be painted, right? So uh, we call them guys the new residential painters. We also have commercial painters, which all the new buildings, the hotels, the hospitals, everything that goes up here um, has to be painted as well. And them are our commercial painters. And then we have a different breed. It's called our industrial painters. Um, and our industrial painters work at places such as uh, John Deere or they install flooring, um, um, specialized flooring coatings and things like that. So they get into our more industrial type coatings. Um, so there's several opportunities out there, um, you know, and, and starting with a residential repainter, you know, you can work for them. Typically they're non-union and then we have several places in here that are union shops here in the Quad Cities. Um, and with those guys, you would go through an apprenticeship program. And the apprenticeship program, uh, I believe you have to be 18 to get into the program. And it's a three-year program. And they will teach you pretty much everything there is to know about painting. And it starts, so in the apprenticeship program, you would start out with wages probably in the 20 to $22 range plus benefits. And as you progress through that three years, and once you become a journeyman, um, journeyman wages average probably in the $5 range per hour with benefits. Um, so, and then the res repainters, I know. Um, depending on how good you are. If you're starting out, they're probably going to start you out in the uh, $15 to $20 range, and they can go all the way up to $30, $40, depending on on what they do for, you know, as far as new res or res repaint and things like that. So, Denny, what are some of the hours or typical work week look like for a painter? Um, once again, it depends on which side you do, but uh, most of my crew, I'll start at the upper level of the, the union shops and the big commercial guys. They usually start their day between 6.30 and 7 in the morning, um, and then they work from 3.30 to 5, depending on the, on the project. Um, our residential painters, as you can imagine, people are in their houses, so their days usually start between 8 and 9. And then our new residential painters, they're the ones that probably work the longest hours. They probably work from seven and then they can go to seven or eight at night, depending on if the house has to be done, you know, if there's a parade home and things like that. So um, they may work a little longer hours. Um, the nice thing about new residential is that there's really nobody in your way, right? So it's a new house, you can go in and, and get your job done and it's kind of quiet. So them are the typical hours. Can you talk maybe a little about the education or training that you need? Absolutely. So like, like I said, with the union, they will give you that training. Um, and they uh, usually hire a couple times a year. I know right now uh, that they are looking for apprentices. With the new res or the res repaint guys, that's really, um, you know, if you have an interest in it, that's just really trying to find somebody that's looking for help. And right now everybody's looking for help. Um, and they would do on-the-job training because each one of those guys are individual. They like to have you do things the way they've done it. So they train you in on an individual basis for that. So what, what age do you hire? So if there are high school students wanting to get into this career, um, what are some things they can start doing now? Are they um, able to be hired by you guys? Well, so... Again, I'm on the other side of the table, so I'll speak about Sherwin Williams as well, if that's okay. So the answer to your question is, is yeah, we, we hire people in our stores. You wouldn't actually be a painter, but you would be on the other side of the bench mixing the paint and dealing with the paint. And we do hire uh, high school students as part-time help. And then you can work your way into what we call a manager training program. 
uh, manager training program, simply you go through a program for a year and then you come out of that program and you'd be an assistant manager in one of our stores. And then uh, within a year of that time, or after a year, roughly, uh, and assuming there's an opening, you can move up to store managers. And then, uh, so you can progress through our company pretty rapidly, if you like, if that's your desire. Our comp uh, I'm going to tell you it's the greatest paint company I've ever worked for, and I've worked for three of them in my career. So Sherwin-Williams is uh, <clears throat> great. Flipping back to the painter side, I am sure that there's plenty of painters out there that would hire high school kids for helping. The, the issue that I would say that most of them will have is that most of them work during the day. So there's some weekends that they work. Um, and I would say the union shops, you would not be able to, as a high school kid, work for there because it's apprenticeship program, which, which requires you to be 18. Um, are there any, uh, like, dangers to your job? I see, you know, there's obviously some workers there and the picture's up on scaffolding. So um, what, would, what would any dangers be or what safety precautions do you take? Yeah, obviously, with every job, there's dangers, correct? And I would say the, the most danger that you would be in in a painting position is that you will be on ladders, you will be on scaffolding, you will be high puts in regulations that uh, every painter should follow and most do um, so I would say you know and in the commercial industry um, there's obviously more because then you're working around several different trades at one time so hard hats are required you know safety protection equipment is always required in those jobs um, you know the res repaint guys they're really kind of all by themselves and so and so is the new res guys they're kind of by themselves so there's not as much uh safety equipment required for that and the dangers are a little less just because there's no other trades there with you but um of course paint is as we all know it's even though it's come a long way in all the years i've worked here it's still a toxic material right so respirators and things like that are always a good idea um, to wear when you're working around the paint industry. And we um, do have a question in the chat. So the question um, is, you both have non-traditional bricklayer and masonry related careers. How do you get involved and why did you choose your current positions? Well, I can speak to that. So uh, how I got involved was um, I went to the University of Iowa, as you can see on my uh, bio there. I went to the University of Iowa and I completed two years in the University of Iowa and I decided, you know, I ever pay down my debt. So I went back home here to the Quad Cities and started working at Iowa Paint uh, that summer to make some money and uh, decided that it's not such a bad deal. It was a good deal and it was a good company and I liked what I was doing and that's how I got involved and now 35 years, 35 years later, I'm, I'm continuing to do it and um, I progressed up through the ranks, so now I'm a I'm a, a commercial sales representative for Sherwin Williams, which is is about the top level of sales rep you can be. And then next part is management, and I I didn't personally have an interest in that, but uh, if you work for a company like ours, you can certainly get in the management side and progress up quite a ways too. Jenny, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I. Uh... I started out on the association side, the nonprofit side, and had never worked for construction industry before. And it really opened my eyes to how great of career opportunities and how great the industry is. And so I recommend all of you, you know, to consider a um, career in the skilled trade, whatever it may be, masonry, painting, or the other ones that are out there. So. And I might add too that uh, in the masonry industry and the painting industry, we typically work hand in hand as those guys are bricklayers and, and the stuff that they do. Eventually everybody wants to change colors and stuff. So we, we typically work with them on almost every project that is where coatings are gonna go on that. So uh, both careers have, uh, have great potential for you guys.
And can you talk about what is some of the equipment or tools that you need and work with for your careers? Denny, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so uh, several different things. Again, and it depends on I keep going back to which which career choose choice you have as commercial or or residential. So of course, brushes, rollers, was um, spray equipment is a big one. Um, scaffolding that we talked about. Um, and really, I mean, there's, you know, there's power washers that you clean things with. So, um, and then when you get into commercial work, there's uh, JLGs, which are used to reach high points that scaffolding you can't build up and things like that. So for the most part, that's the bulk of what you would be using as a painter. So in the masonry industry, your number one tool is a trowel. And then you've got different trowels depending on what you're doing. There is some tuck pointing equipment. And what tuck pointing or repointing is, is the mortar only lasts probably 50 or so years. So every so often you have to go uh, um, fix it. And so you're taking the old mortar out, putting in new mortar or caulk. And so there's special tools for that. You had seen on the picture earlier a joiner, which is how you finish the mortar joint after you've laid the masonry unit in it. And then you have your mixer to mix your mortar. You have tubs. You have stands that you put the mortar on. Uh, you have scaffolding. You have chisels. You have saws. So there's a wide variety of tools that you're going to use on the job site. And that's all something that you learn, you know, with your apprenticeship and with experience. So are those tools that you both mentioned something that the employees have to provide or is that provided by the employer? Typically for our apprentices. In our end, in our end of the painting end, I would say that most of the time they are in, provided by the employer. Uh, I know in the union shop, they expect you to have a I believe they call it a gaff bag. Now, I could be wrong, but um, they supply your first set of tools, brushes, rollers, and things like that. And then typically after that, you normally have to pick up your own. So for masonry, when you go into the apprenticeship program, there's a tool bag that you purchase at 50% off. Um, you know, so it's, it's not too expensive. And so that you know, you are responsible for some of your own tools, but all the big um, equipments, the saws, the mixers, that's all provided by the company. So is there like a trailer or a van or something like that that's provided to the employees to use or do they use their own um, form of transportation to and from these sites or how does that work? Mm -hmm. For masonry, it depends. It depends where the job site is. Um, so if it's in Des Moines and the crew is from Des Moines, they're just going to drive to the job site. But if they're traveling, um, there's vans and trucks that kind of carpool. Um, so it just, it all depends. And the, and the same thing with painting. If it's, if it's local stuff, typically you just go right to the job site. There's some uh, painters that have shops, then guys would meet, or girls would meet in the shop and uh, possibly start their day there. But for the most part, yeah, you travel to the job site on your own. I had um, asked this question to Jenny earlier, so, and Denny, I want to ask it to you as well. Um, what are some things that you enjoy most about what you do, and what are some challenges that you face? I probably the most enjoyable part of my, my position is, is that I get to meet new people every day um, and uh, technology when it comes to coatings changes virtually every day so um, when I started 35 years ago it was uh, pretty basic coatings now everything with the ozone and and the uh, regulations we have everything's went to what we call zero VLCs which stands for volatile organic compounds so coatings over the years have gotten much better and much more uh, friendly for the ozone and us as well as we breathe in so um, I would say for me uh, the reward is always the people right the people I work with 
uh, the people I deal with, the people I sell with. And, and when I'm in the field talking to the painters, um, which um, is the field we're talking about, all those guys as well would, would let you know that it's rewarding, right? So when you drive by a, uh, a hotel and you say, hey, you know, I had my hand in painting that. So that's my fingers on that. So, or, or if it's a house and you drive by a house and say, you know, we did that. That's my work. So it's very rewarding on that end as well. And everybody I talk to says the same thing about in the paint industry. And I'm sure that's can be said for any industry you're in, masonry or electrical or anything. It, you take pride in your work and that's, um, and it's always there, right? So you always know I did that. Um, and this question is for both of you. Is there anything more on the creative side that you've had to do or any projects that have been especially fun or memorable? Um, yeah, for me, for me, it was, um, I would say probably the, the most memorable one that I had is that I had a hand involved in the big sky bridge that was built in downtown Dapham a few years ago. So that was us specifying it and, and getting the products for that. And um, so that was good. And then probably the other big one is the Genesis Tower that they just did a couple of years ago. Um, we put a new type of coating in there and it's a, a coating that is will actually kill staff and MRSA and things like that. So it's a coating we put on the walls that actually kills um, form of bacteria. So that was pretty exciting that we are leading the industry in something like that. So we got some of that in the in the hospital. So that was probably a highlight. And what about for your side, Jenny? Anything creative or memorable? Yeah, um, there, gosh, there's been several. Um, recently, one of my contractors uh, ha had the contract to redo a bunch of brick at the state capitol in the dome. Um, I don't know if you you all realize but that dome is actually brick and then it's covered with like gold sheeting and the original brick oh close to probably 200 years old it was handmade brick on site so over the years it's it's the technology to make that brick isn't what it is today so the brick starts deteriorating after a couple hundred years and so they went in there and they're like hanging off the dome underneath with the scaffolding, redoing it. And I got to go tour while they were doing it. Um, I got to go walk around the dome at the top where in, I don't know how many stories up our capital is, but um, walk around and they had a porta potty out there on the scaffolding and the top of the dome. And so that was really cool. And then um, another project is in Des Moines as well it was a sculpture that they did along the river walk where they took brick and they cut it down so they made a cylinder it looked like a solo cup and so every single brick was actually hand cut to fit and so it was really cool to see how they came up because it, it's not something that had really been done before and so they had the architects the engineers the brick plant in the mason contractor all working together on this project to figure out how to make it work and they did it so um, cool. you know you get to see some really cool innovative um, things going on in the industry and something else they have is they have an automated bricklayer um, called sam and so it's i've seen it in person and <clears throat> and so it's really cool to see that they're constantly developing the industry and looking for new, faster, more cost-effective ways to do everything. And a question we have in the chat, and Denny kind of mentioned on this a little bit, is um, how has COVID affected your industry? You said you had paint that killed MRSA and germs, so, which is really interesting. I didn't know that was a thing. But um, how has COVID affected both of your industries? Denny, if you want to answer that first. Yeah, so um, kind of it's, it's affected our industry two different ways. So most of the commercial stuff, um, us living in the Quad Cities and Illinois shutting down a little more than Iowa, uh, we lost several jobs because of that. So jobs actually just stopped in Illinois. Commercial, I'm talking about commercial. Um, and in Iowa, they kind of kept going. So for me personally, um, 
things slowed down a lot between March and, and they're just now starting to pick back up. Um, however, the other side that we talked about earlier, the residential repaint side where we're going into people's houses and painting, that took off. So people wanted their house done because they're at home or restaurants that were closed, they wanted it repainted or, or bars or whatever the case was, they wanted them repainted. So that side of the business took off and the commercial side dipped. Um, new residential side also took off because there was, um, so COVID affected some of us and others, it actually helped. How about you, Jenny? How has COVID impacted your careers? It, we haven't seen a huge dip. Um, the job sites on the commercial side kept running. Um, in the, especially the contractors, there was a lot of jobs that were already on the books. Uh, they, they kept on going. They just, you know, made COVID, you know, they take their temperature before they get on the job site, all that. And so they didn't see a huge dip in anything. And they did see, you know, that they've got projects scheduled out. So um, they're not seeing the effects. I do know on the supplier side, um, for those that like manufacture brick block and mortar, um, it went gangbusters this year because those suppliers supply both residential and commercial. And the commercial stayed steady and every single residential person decided they were gonna do their home improvement projects during COVID. And so they're running to the big box stores to grab landscaping block, mortar, you know, do retaining walls, do, do their landscaping. And so, everybody stayed busy throughout um you know construction was considered essential workers so they didn't get shut down and so um you know they they all kept busy another question that came up in the chat is how closely do you work with other trades like architects engineers and carpenters Well, I'll answer that. For me, I work uh, very closely with the architects, engineers, um, carpenters, drywall, the drywall side of things, um, and the masons, like I said. So um, in, in my industry, when we're looking at projects, uh, the specifications, uh, and I don't know if you guys have ever talked about specifications, so forgive me if I'm overstepping and they don't understand this, but a specification just is a booklet that says, this is what we expect out of this building being built, and there's several sections. So um, we look at every section because there's probably some type of coding in each section, be it uh, masonry, be it uh, drywall, all of those sections have some type of coding that are gonna go on it. So. Yeah, we work very closely with all of those. Same with masonry. I think in this day and age, I don't think a lot of people realize how important that communication is between the trades because everything is interlinked. Take a block wall, for example. You know, you are going to need electrical run through that. You're going to need your HVAC. Um, the plumbing, all that. And so they all have to coordinate, um, you know, to make sure that all runs smoothly. And especially on the commercial job sites, usually the masons or the bricklayers are one of the first ones on the job site. You know, you lay your foundation and then they start building those block, or bl those block walls and then the other trades follow um, to get everything put in and um, making sure that it all runs smoothly. So what are some things our high school students watching now can start to do to maybe at some classes or um, things they can do on their own at home to start preparing for your types of careers? Well, as far as painting goes, obviously just uh, pick up a brush and roller and, and, you know, repaint your bedrooms or whatever, that'll get you started. Um, uh, if it's if it's a career that uh, you want in the the commercial side of the industry, um, don't be afraid to reach out to myself. Reach out to um, you know the hall, the union hall, and talk to them about that as well. And and I would be happy to supply. I don't have the number here, unfortunately, I didn't get it, but I would be happy to supply that. Or if anybody wants to call one of our paint stores, they can do that as well. 
And if you decide that uh, maybe you don't want to put it on the wall and you want to be in the paint store, by all means, you can uh, call one of our stores and they can get you in touch of how to handle that as well. So on the masonry end, I can't emphasize enough having basic understanding of math skills. Uh, you need to be able to read a tape measure, add simple fractions, uh, there's a lot of math, and your communication skills. You need to be able to work as a team. Uh, those group projects you do in school, it's going to be the same way in the job site. You know, you're meeting with the other uh, industries to work together. You're working with your team of other bricklayers, the super your superintendent, the job foreman, you know, uh, communication. And so if it is something you are interested in, the our local union that does the training program has a lot of opportunities to meet with you, to talk about that skill set, to get you on a job site so you can job shadow and, you know, set up a time if you want to put a trowel in your hand and see if it's something you enjoy. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity to dive in more as well as getting, you know, your just basic education because they are skills you are going to use. Yeah, and that's a very good point. I would agree that uh, math is a big skill for all the trades. Um, you're going to have to figure square foot and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's, we're not talking calculus and we're not talking all the other stuff, but um, basic math is, is very important. So I believe um, I've answered all of the student questions that there were. Mary or Julie, did you have any question, other questions for Denny or Jenny? Julie added in the chat, um, you can contact her and I'll let her talk a little bit about that. Um, one question I have that we've had at every single question, I know you've kind of both touched on that. Um, can the students do, work and would you recommend maybe another trade we in the some of the other sessions we've talked about general laborers that they could do maybe between their junior and senior year would you recommend that those would be good skills so that they can then when they get their diploma in turn 18 could start in your industries absolutely any any skill you can learn in the trade is going to pay off for uh, whatever trade you may decide to use and I know the Davenport school system and um, they have a student built home and that may be something that uh, you can learn several trades in while also building the home. So that's, that's something that uh, may be of interest, you know, and I, I don't know the students we're talking to if they're seniors now or if they're juniors, but I want to say that you can be a junior or senior in that program, um, which has been very good over the years. And um, on that note, Denny, um, even if you're not part of the Davenport Student Built Home or the North Scott Student Built Home, if you're at Pleasant Valley or um, I, I'm not sure about Bettendorf, but I know for Pleasant Valley, you can um, do the Student Built Home. You would just be going to um, Davenport or North Scott to, to participate in that. Most of those students are seniors, but um, I think... Um, Occasionally a junior has been on that, but most of them are, think are seniors. So if you are a freshman or sophomore, one thing to keep in mind is when you're planning your schedules, um, I know that schedules are tight um, with the things that you have to take. So your electives, you know, are, it's important to plan out your four years of school if you want to do student built home because you don't want to end up your senior year and not have enough time to do that. So if you're a younger student, that is something to take a look at, you know, your freshman, sophomore year, so you make time to do that throughout your schooling. So I just, oh, go ahead, Jenny. I just want to note on our end, for any, anybody that's interested, for most of our contractors, that are union, you need to be 18 to be on the job site. So, you know, once you turn 18, you probably could look at getting a part-time job, but another great way to get that experience is to ask to do a job shadow. You know, they'll take you out on the job site, let you see it 
what a job site looks for, you know, firsthand. So, you know, I encourage all of you to, you know, to explore your options that way as well. Are the industries, in your industries, Denny and um, Jenny, taking job shadows right now or are they on hold because of COVID? For us, it depends on the job site. The contractors in the union have no issues with it, but there, there may be some that aren't allowing visitors. Um, so, but I mean, there's enough going on that they can, they can find one. They can find a job site for you. And unfortunately, I can't answer that question. I wouldn't know the answer to that. Thanks. And I just want to note too, Lauren did put in the chat that any Davenport juniors that are interested in learning more about Student Built Home Program um, to contact her. And she did provide her email there, in case you didn't see that. And then um, we do have a slide too on the PowerPoint that is just going to have some more um, information and links for more information that we covered during this um, presentation today. So if there are any kind of last minute burning questions you have for Denny or Jenny, now would be the time to either unmute, unmute yourself and ask or type those in the chat. There's, I'm not seeing any other um, questions in the chat, Mary or Julie, if you don't have anything else. Um, I'm going to just say real quick, um, I did put my information in the chat and just let the students on here know and the ones that will watch the recording that if you are interested in talking more with Jenny or Denny, um, on opportunities or just information, um, you can always reach out to me um, directly and then I will get you in con uh, connected with them. Or if you've been on another um, uh, video or session um, today or yesterday, the same thing goes for that. Um, part of my job is to connect you to the outside trades world. So our, we want to make sure that um, you get that information so you have a career path if that's what you choose and to get you started on that. So that's it. And I'd like to add students that are interested in the job shadow aspect, you can contact Ms. Hargrave, myself from PV, um, Haley Hoyt from Bettendorf. If you're, on, if you're there on Bettendorf, Illinois, you can talk to your counselors and they can connect you. You can also tell them to reach out to uh, Ms. Hargrave or myself uh, and we'd be happy to help uh, set up those job shadows opportunities. Well, on that, thank you so much to Denny and Jenny for spending um, some time with us. <laughs> you have a lot of great information <laughs> the students for submitting your wonderful questions and hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Great, right, thank you everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you everyone for joining us and allowing us to be part of your meeting. Thank you, Denny. Thanks, Jenny.